The ancient Romans were a people famed for their architectural prowess, something no better demonstrated than by their ability to build almost perfectly straight and incredibly durable roads spanning expansive distances. For example, in Britain alone, the Romans built over 50,000 miles of roads, with the longest ruler-straight stretch spanning over 50 miles. They did all of this in an era without modern surveying tools, construction equipment, or even very accurate maps of precisely where their destination was for many of the areas. So, well, how did they do it? To begin with, it's important to note that there were a few different types of road that were made throughout the Roman Republic and Empire, and the exact method and materials used for road construction varied somewhat from region to region and evolved slightly over the centuries. With that caveat out of the way, the three main classifications of Roman roads were via terrani, essentially dirt roads often made by people walking and wagons riding over the same path over time, via glari, which was a dirt road that was then graveled, and finally, much more interestingly, via munitia, which were more or less paved roads, some of which have survived through modern times. With these types of roads, there were further classifications based on who could use them, such as public roads, military or state roads, and private roads constructed at private expense, and for the owners to decide who they allowed access to, and this could perhaps be the general public or perhaps just a select few. To help pay for them, roads of all types often had tolls, particularly at locations like bridges and city gates, where it would be impractical to avoid the tolling location. So this brings us to the road construction process itself. As dirt and gravel roads are not particularly interesting, we're going to focus this video on paved roads. So how did they make these incredibly durable and generally straight roads? After all, even with modern machinery, constructing and maintaining an expansive road system is an extremely time-consuming and labor-intensive process. To start with, a group of surveyors would be sent out to figure out the precise direction connecting the two main points. At the same time, they'd attempt to plan the route as efficiently as possible while accounting for any major obstacles like tall mountains, rivers, etc. When possible, they may attempt to avoid such obstacles, but particularly in some of the earliest Roman road constructions where it might result in having to take a large detour to get around, for example, a mountain, if possible given the terrain, they tended just to build the road to go directly over the mountain mountain or directly through it. For example, the longest tunnel through such a mountain was the Grotta de Cocceo, which was excavated from 38 to 36 BCE and is approximately 1 km that's 0.62 miles long and about 5 meters, 5.4 yards high and wide. Before World War II, it was also still a fully functional and safe to traverse tunnel despite standing for about 2000 years at that point, but unfortunately it was damaged during the war, though there are presently efforts going on to have it repaired and reopened to the public. As for going over a mountain, it's important to note here that we don't mean they'd use switchbacks as is the general method today. No, if at all possible, they'd just build roads straight up over a mountain and down the other side, expecting that soldiers and mules and the like would just man up and traverse the steep slopes without complaint. That said, as the empire matured, it did eventually become apparent that there were economic advantages to slightly longer roads that were easier for draft animals to pull carts over, and thus there was a shift to favoring longer distances but less a gradient when talking roads for general public use. Either way, during the process, the surveyors would set up markers, often at very visible points like on hills, mapping out the optimal path, again trying to ensure that the road would be as straight as possible between the start and the end point to reduce needed labor, materials, and distance needed to traverse the road once it was complete. So this all brings us to how they actually ensured perfectly straight roads between the markers. A key tool here was a device known as a gromer. In a nutshell, this was nothing more than a sort of cross with four weights hanging from a string at each end of the cross to function as plumb lines. The whole thing could rotate with degree markers on top. Two of the plumb lines would then be lined up with a marker and then on the other side lined up with the previous marker. Where changes in direction would need to be made, the degrees were marked and ultimately the whole thing drawn up on a central document showing the entire route of the road with each segment. Once the actual construction was to begin, the gromer would once again be used, this time with rods pounded into the grounds between markers, using the gromer to make sure that every single rod was perfectly in line between the markers. Now, finally, construction of the road would start, usually first done via plows to loosen the soil. This would be followed by legionnaires and or slaves digging the ground out with depth varying based on conditions. For instance, swampy lands would need a lot thicker foundation if it was to have any staying power. For more typical ground, 
ground the trench needed to be, somewhere in the realm of three to six feet, that's around one to two meters deep. Once dug out, this would then be tamped down to a leveled, compact layer of earth. From here, the exact road composition varied based on available materials in a given region, as well as land composition and a bunch of other factors like this. But typically, large stones would be packed as tightly as possible together and into the earth base. Onto this layer would usually be placed smaller stones, sometimes comprising broken concrete or somewhat crushed rock. Again, it would be packed and smoothed as best as possible. Depending on availability, they would also put a layer of sand on this foundation to make a genuinely perfectly smooth surface. On top of all of this, at the minimum, gravel would be added, packed, and leveled. In some cases, such as near big cities, as described in one manuscript on the construction of roads in Rome itself, paving stones, often flint, lava rock, or marble, would be embedded in cement for the top layer instead. When the road was complete, they are thought to have been quite smooth, allowing for relatively bump-free travel in carts and things like that. During this whole process, special attention was taken to making the center of the road higher than the sides so that any water would drain off, with the entire road surface itself also elevated above the ground so on the sides drainage ditches could be put and these would generally help move water away in times of heavy rains. As for the size of the roads, according to something known as the Law of Twelve Tables, which more or less formed the basis of Roman law for almost a millennia, Roman roads were required to be at minimum eight Roman feet wide, about two and a half meters, where the road was straight and double that if the road happened to be curved. Beside the roads were footpaths, sometimes gravels, which were particularly handy in the case of private roads, where only people with proper authorization could use the road itself. Finally, at the very outer edges of the roads, any nearby trees and bushes would be removed to help reduce areas for bandits to hide and surprise anyone with an attack. It also helped to ensure that plant growth didn't overtake the road or tree roots compromise it. But this still wasn't the end of the construction process. They now needed to know exact distances along the road. It's not fully clear how they did this, though a device known as the Odometer of Vitruvius is mentioned starting around 27 BC and is often claimed to have been used for this purpose. However, whether it was actually ever used for road construction or even made at all is still up for debate. At a high level, this device used the spinning of a wheel to mark distance. In this case, it was the spinning of a wagon wheel, which was in turn hooked up to gears that would a pebble into a container every Roman mile, that's 4,841 feet, which is around a thousand paces for an adult male. Indeed, the word mile derives from the Latin milia, meaning, funnily enough, a thousand paces. For whatever it's worth, while Leonardo da Vinci tried and failed to make such a device as per outlined, in 1981, one Andre Slieswick was successful in building one exactly as described, except unlike da Vinci, he used triangular gear teeth instead of square ones. His justification for this modification being that these same type of gear teeth were used in the Antikythera mechanism, which was created sometime from around 250 to 70 BC, with the device itself used to predict various astronomical phenomena like eclipses. Thus, Perhaps if the odometer of Vitruvius was ever actually built and used, maybe it had these too. There are, of course, many other, much less technologically advanced ways they could have measured mile distances easily enough with extreme accuracy. However they did it, at every mile mark, the law required them to place an approximately two-ton, seven-foot tall, with two feet in the ground, mile marker called a malarium. Helpfully, on this stone would be engraved the names of the locations the road connected to and how many miles to each one from that respective marker it was. A master marker known as the Malario Aurei, or Golden Milestone, was also created during Caesar Augustus's rule and placed in the central forum of Rome itself. This was the one point at which all Roman roads were said to lead. It's not actually clear what was on this master marker, but it's been speculated that it listed the distances from that point to all major cities under Roman rule. Whatever the case, like the roads themselves, some of these mile markers are still standing today, giving archaeologists and historians a valuable snapshot of the past, since they tended to to include not just basic geographic information, but information about when the road was built or repaired and by whom. Next up, it was also required by law that regular way stations be built for official use, generally every 16 to 19 miles apart. These were more or less really nice resting areas, providing food and drink and the like for the officials. For the general public, inns would tend to pop up near these way stations. On that note, at particularly high-trafficked way stations, many other businesses would pop up as well, sometimes leading to the creation of whole towns. 
Along these roads, you'd also find, at similar intervals, changing stations where people could get the services of veterinarians, wheelwrights, etc., as well as potentially find new mounts. To give you an idea of how fast one could move along these roads with its network of way stations and facilities, it's noted that Emperor Tiberius once traversed about 200 miles in 24 hours after news that his brother was dying from gangrene after being seriously injured falling from a horse. A more typical time to traverse for, say, a government mail carrier was usually about 50 miles per day, if not in a particular hurry. But to sum it up, it turns out that Roman road construction, amenities and all, wasn't all that different from modern times, often featuring deep foundations, paved surfaces, proper drainage, landscaping around the roads, sidewalks, toll booths, rest areas, hotels, restaurants, the historic equivalent of gas stations and convenience stores, etc. In short, the ancient Romans they were pretty brilliant in a lot of ways.